The National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools, NAPS, has assured the federal government of the readiness of the schools under its fold to resume for the West African Senior School Certificate Examination and other terminal examinations. The association's clamor for resumption follows the withdrawal of Nigeria's participation in the sub-regional examination on Wednesday by the federal government over safety reasons. Its national president, Yomi Otubela, said at a news conference held virtually that he can vouch that members have gone through all the safety measures outlined by the NCDC in their schools and that they are over 100% ready for the transitional classes to resume. Lamenting the suspension of the West African Senior Certificate uh, School Certificate Examination, the NAPS president said it would cause emotional trauma for the affected SS3 uh, pupils who have been preparing for the examination and may cause them to lose interest in education. Well, Folawe Umikunde, who is the CEO Teach for Nigeria, joins us now in studio to take a look at this twist. It's good to have you, Folawe. Thank you for having me, and good morning. Uh, good to have you. I, I don't know what you're thinking, and I don't know how you, what, what do you feel about all of this conversation mm -hmm. uh, about school closure, or should we open, mm -hmm. or whether we are ready or not. I mean, the, the private schools have said they are over. 100% mm. ready. Mm. What's your thought on all that is happening? So I'm processing all of this that I'm hearing, and I'm hearing a lot of things. But on the other hand, and I'm also thinking about countries who have successfully reopened their, school, their schools. And there are four things that I found. One is that these countries have kept their cases down. They've kept the numbers down. The second thing is these countries have got data. The third thing is that these countries are going on, they have ongoing research that is happening. And then the fourth thing is that this clear communication and this communication is um, also shared timely. And so when I think about everything, there is such confusion. So on one end, you hear the news from the minister, you know, who says that the schools are going to reopen. And on another end, you hear another news from the minister of state who says this, guy, this news and this um, not reopening schools doesn't bind um, the state's government. Right, and so there is just so who, who do we follow? Like who do we listen to? So across the ecosystem, you see distrust, you see you know miscommunication. You hear on another end that parents are tired and parents want their children to go back. I mean, valid re reasons to go back to school and take the exam. But what what I know and looking at the guidelines is that there is no way that our schools are prepared to reopen the schools, to social distance, to ensure that teachers and the entire school community is protected to be able to write these exams. I think another thing that this has brought to the fore is that we have treated education like it's just one single, you know, one bullet, right? And from all of these things that I've shared with you, you've seen the role that media plays in terms of like communication. You've seen the role that, you know, the, the Bureau of Statistics will play in terms of data research and just ongoing capturing of data, like, you know, how is infection happening in schools? What is the transmission rate? As you're seeing across other countries that have successfully opened, you know, you're also seeing just even the training and support that is given to teachers. You're you're seeing the technological infrastructure, you know, from like private sector and what have you. So you see the connection. You see the role of the health officials as well. You know, so Ministry of Health shouldn't be divorced from the conversation that they're having with respect to reopening the schools. And I think it's that connection that, you know, I've always talked about, like, Ed, running a thriving and successful education in the country is not just going to rely on the Ministry of Education or all the agencies that focus that you know that focus on education, but it's like all of these other actors. And I think what is happening here with us and what is bringing so much confusion is the fact that you can see that there is no connection. Mm -hmm. You can see that there is no alignment across all of these different actors and stakeholders who should be talking and who should be coming together and deliberating on these matters. Again, if we're not really containing it yet, if the numbers are spiking, as you've just shared, if we're having increased cases, we also have no business talking about this. Mm -hmm. And I think what we should be discussing and talking about is how can we ensure that learning continues to happen? What are the innovations? How can we find ways to ensure that maybe we we tra you know we transmit this exam online. Maybe this exam is then you know done online. But as but we know that we've always had issues. Like how are you going to take an exam where there's some of these students who have never been you know fortunate to even um, see a computer or touch a computer. So you know we have all of that to think about. Even the teachers and invigilators. So we know that you know we cannot. 
um, we cannot um, facilitate or accelerate, you know, the immediate transition to online for the test to be taken. And we know that this is probably only going to be done physically. But we need to really think creatively. And I think what, what we should be doing now is investing in some of the solutions and inventions that we're seeing that could help our children to stay engaged and to continue learning. Now, essentially, uh, Flower, if I hear you, you're saying we don't have all that it takes yet to go this way. Now, I mean, you are passionate about education. Now, you do know that education is crucial. While we are having this conversation, we are talking of students and pupils across all the institutions who are at home and not able to get their learning. Mm. What does that portend for us, even in the near future? So I know that, I mean, we are going to have immense learning loss. And I think that this conversation that we're having should go beyond just reopening of schools. But it's to say, as a country, this is a situation that we faced. What does that mean for our curriculum? What does it mean for how we're going to support students going forward? What does it mean for how we're going to support teachers, recruit teachers, train them going forward, just so that we're able to mitigate you know, the gap and the risk that we're going to face potentially down the line from like, you know, loss in, in grade level and loss of learning you know, if, if this continues. But another thing that I like to say, and someone recently shared on a group that I'm part of, is when there is war in a nation, I mean, do we deliberate on whether schools should open or not? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is how we should treat this situation. Like, it's not whether or not, it's are we, is it safe to do so? We cannot gamble with this. I mean, you're looking at some of the examples of African countries who have reopened their schools. Ghana, for example, and in the week that the schools were reopened, or in the month, there was 22,000 plus cases, you know, new cases that grew. 90% um, of the staff at the ministry, you know, were, um, were infected by the virus. And then also schools across Ghana, you know, also had cases that they recorded. And so, you know, it's like watching all of these things and saying, are we really, really prepared? Like, mm. there's going to be loss of learnings. But I'm also hearing, I'm encouraged by some of the things that I'm hearing happening in other countries, in Europe, for example, where they're leveraging some of their best teachers in this time, and, but they're using technology. And they're saying, how can we get our best math English teachers, you know, to teach students, you know, at scale? But then how can we then get, like, teachers in communities to then facilitate group gatherings and learnings? You know, what are we doing with that? How are we bringing the people who are closest to the problem into conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, we're having all of these conversations. It's taking place, you know, at ASO Rock and probably the agencies and parasitals, you know, in charge of education. But how are we bringing in the teachers, how are we bringing in the principals into these different conversations, all of these stakeholders? Because the truth is, implementation is going to happen at community level. Mm -hmm. And so how are we bringing them to contribute, you know, to how we would um, plan ourselves going forward? And that brings me to my next question. Uh, you know, because when uh, things like this happen we hear the government issue a statement we hear the government saying this how are we going to come to the practical points where yes stakeholders like you would engage and then we'll see results because so far we've been hearing communication statements here and there what is the practical way forward so i think the only place and i i've shared this a few times and i've seen this is in lagos state where I've seen the Commissioner for Education literally visit schools just to check, you know, while they were talking, you know, so the guidelines came came first. No, before the guideline came, came, we heard about them trying to reopen school and that there was going to be guidelines that would be shared. And then the only person that I found doing, you know, visiting of schools and really just trying to understand the context mm -hmm. was the Commissioner for Education in Lagos. And, you know, from there, they were able to identify schools that didn't have the, you know, water facility facility, schools that didn't have certain sanitary facility, you know, schools that needed to fix certain things. And then that way, they had data that was informing their plans. Mm -hmm. They had data to say, you know what, we'll have to have temporary um, wash hand basins here if we're going to reopen schools and things like that. And, I, and talking to even community leaders, talking to the obas, talking to the chiefs. And I think that's where we need to get to. You know, it's a point where we need the leadership um, the people in charge to make those connections, to engage stakeholders, to talk to teachers. What does this mean for you? To talk to the principals, you know, what would this mean for your school? Mm -hmm. And that's the only way that we're going to get to it. The Minister for Education, the Minister for State isn't going to come and do that at the local level, but the district officials, the principals, you know, can have those conversations and that can be facilitated by the leadership in the state. Mm -hmm.
I mean, let's talk about uh, the statement from the NAPS president, mm -hmm. Yomi, who says that he can vouch that the school are over 100% ready. And here you are saying, essentially, what, what you see from all that's going on, we're not ready. So who is he speaking for? And I mean, who should we hear? So I would say that if, if the private schools were given a chance to reopen schools and to you know, write the exams, I, I, I'm more confident that they would be able to put the guidelines that has been shared in place. Um, but then at the same time, the private schools are equally struggling at this time. Yeah. You, have, you, you, know, you haven't really looked at the funding aspect where there are lots of parents who are not able to pay the tuition. There are lots of parents who haven't been able to pay um, you know, fees. And so private schools are struggling, for example, with paying teachers' salaries and what have you. So you have those issues in place, right? And then I'm hearing you say body disinfectant. I'm hearing you say you know, all of this infrastructure, you know, these things that you have to get, right? And it's like, really, are, are all private schools and all schools under NAPS and all the other associations really going to be able to, you know, put these things in place and effectively implement these guidelines? I'm not convinced. Um, and yes, I do think that private schools could do a better job than the public schools, but I'm not convinced that over, they're over 100 percent ready. Mm. Yes. Thank you so very much for that. Well, Mikunde, the CEO for Teach for Nigeria. It's always a pleasure to have you in the studio. Thank you for Share your thoughts. Me.